morning, church. Good to see you. Happy hot Sunday to you. Is anybody hot right now? Anybody cold right now? Anybody just perfect right now? Oh, God bless you. Yes. Thank you. I was not expecting that. I am pleasantly surprised. Fantastic. By the way, speaking of surprises, everybody look past Donald here in the corner. Did you notice the corner of crud is gone? All the chairs, all the stuff, it is gone. All those extra chairs that have been stacked for years are now out here. They are here, so we have created more empty spaces for our guests to come, so I don't have to be looking like, oh, where did I sit? So you're going to see a few more empty seats. Help visitors find four seats together or more, okay? If you see, try not to, you know, scoot in if you can. It'll help free up some space. So just want to let you guys know that is a blessing. We have finally got it. Thank you, Donald, for doing that, standing over there, guarding it. I am fired up. Let me ask you a quick question. Who is the richest person you know? Me. Oh, oh, look at you. (laughs) Somebody's getting spiritual here. My pastor is rich in God's love. No, I mean old school. You don't have to be spiritual. Old school dollars. Dollarinos. Who is the richest person you know personally? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Now, let let me ask you a question. The first billionaire in American history, you know, anybody know who it was? Close, close, right, right first two letters. John D. Rockefeller. Yes, yes, in the early 1900s, the peak of his wealth came when he was aged 74 years old, and it said he was worth more than 300 billion in today's dollars. 300 billion. Now, that's a, that's a big number. I don't have that. I have a hard time wrapping my head around it, but if I had to compare it to today's standards, let's bring it into the modern age and compare how that stacks up against Bill Gates. Bill Gates is said to have had 0.38% of today's total economic output, but John D. Rockefeller was 1.5% of all of America's output. Think about that. Quadruple Bill Gates. Now think about that. That that is a lot. And on one famous occasion, a reporter went up to Mr. Rockefeller and asked him this question. Sir, how much money is enough? And his answer was surprised. He didn't know. But he wasn't going to tell you that. So he said this famous reply. Just a little bit more. How much money is enough? Just a little bit more. I'm always hungry for it. Always wanting more. Now, King Solomon... In our scriptures, we read, not only is the wisest man to have ever lived, but he is the wealthiest man to ever live. How much do you think he had? Most experts and scholars, when they go back and they look, and they they do all the numbers and they run, they think about his vast reserves of wealth, put his wealth between, pause for effect, two and three trillion dollars. Two and three trillion dollars. Y'all, we can't even wrap our heads around that. Yet he would go on in Ecclesiastes to say, pursuing gold and silver is vanity. It means nothing. In fact, he called it a, quote, fruitless pursuit in an attempt to bring peace. It didn't last. So when we go and we look at the richest billionaire, the first billionaire in America, and he's asked this question, how much is enough? He didn't know. But he didn't admit that he didn't know. He couldn't tell you there wasn't a number, so he simply said, just a little bit more. Which brings me to our opening thought for today. One of the most difficult things in life is to know what you don't know. Or better yet, to know and admit what you don't know. Right, ladies? You know us guys. We're not going to admit it. We're not lost. We're taking the scenic route, right? We don't, we can't admit these things. And so this is In other words, think about this. You don't even know what you don't know until you know you didn't know it. Wrap your head around that. Think about that. You don't even know, right? There are known knowns, but there are also some unknown knowns and some unknown unknowns, things you don't even know that you don't know. Or as as this great meme puts it, I love this. (laughs) This is so good. Even though I know nothing, I at least know that I know nothing. Thus meaning I actually do know one thing, which means I'm back to zero, as the thing I thought I knew is actually not true now, causing me to know nothing at all. (laughs) We we don't even know what we don't know. Let me give you an example of this from my own life, a painful, painful story that I've never shared. A time when I was so clueless, I didn't even know what I didn't know. Most of you know, before BC, before Christ, I was the lead singer of a hard rock band, 
with lots of hair, good hair, almost as good as Marin's hair, but not quite as good as Marin's hair, big and full. And you've seen some pictures of us when we had some moderate success, big stages and stuff, but what you didn't see was what led up to that, because everybody has to have a start. And my start was, uh, let's say, a little rough. My very first band came when I was 14 years old. And it was a band called Long Shot, and we were indeed a long shot at succeeding. In fact, we played just two shows. I found a rare picture of my very first show. You want to see it? Okay, all right, hang on. Don't you do it yet. I got to set this up. And it is okay to laugh, because I do every time. It's not a problem. In this particular show, our first time out, I want you to notice the sweet moves, the sweet hair, and the sweet clothing style, okay? All right, here it is. This is my very first show, my very first, yes, that's me in the middle with the microphone, my Radio Shack realistic microphone. I want you to know at the time, we were scheduled to start at 9.05. We played our entire set, and we were done by 9.15. Okay, because that's how it is, your first game. <laughs> Including, but not limited to, You Give Love a Bad Name. And then we made it into our final closing song, which was Van Halen's, I can still remember this, Van Halen's I Want the Best of Both Worlds. Anybody know that song? And I started to have some problems. Then my voice was going in and out, and then it would drop. And I said, I know just about this much of music, because I hadn't had any classes yet, didn't have any degrees. And I said, you know what, I'm going to still sing these right notes, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to take it down an octave. Yeah, music people know exactly what that means. What that means is basically I was going up for the notes and, I, and it, it just wasn't there. I went from being a lyric tenor overnight to a bass. And I was caught in the middle of the song in front of everybody, a deer in the headlight. You'll see the pic in a minute. There's a photo of this moment. Notice the fear in my eyes, okay? And I went up for these notes, and I, I want the, and I just dropped it. I want the best of both worlds. And I turned into Frank Sinatra somehow on that stage, and I turned into a crooner, and it was horrifying. Here I am, deer in the headlights, not sure. Everybody sat down. It was so bad. Even my bass player is stunned. Look at him. He's looking, what are you doing? My guitarist wouldn't even look me in the eye. It was so bad. It's not done yet. I get in the car, I'm driving home. A little bit later, I'm with my dad, who's also a singer. He said, uh, son, you gonna practice? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I sure am. Song came on the radio. I said, dad, let's not talk. I need to learn this song. So we start listening to the song, and I couldn't hit these notes. I said, I'm just gonna take it down an octave. That's, that's probably what these men do as they get older. You know, I'm becoming a man, I'm 14, it's time. I'm a late bloomer, I know. And we're driving, and he looks at the radio, and he looks at me, and he looks at the radio, and he's driving. He, I could tell he was trying not to say anything to crush my already bruised ego. And finally, he just couldn't take it. He turned off and said, son, you do know that they're singing it an entire octave above you, right? I didn't know, but I kind of did. But I looked at him, and I was afraid to admit it. I said, yeah, I know. But I didn't know. And I was hoping I could get away with singing every song the rest of my life down here in an octave like this. I could go for five hours singing like that, but that wasn't it. I didn't even know how bad it was, what I didn't know, until I was no longer the lead singer of that band. <laughs> one, one and done. What about you? Can you look back in your life and think of a time where you didn't know what you didn't know, and it was embarrassing? Where you didn't even know how clueless you were, maybe parenting. How, how do you know what you don't know until you have your little scutter and then you realize you don't know anything about parenting? And suddenly your parents are smart because they actually made you live and they got you through adolescence and things without hurting you, right? Or maybe you're an investor and you're like, oh, I'm going to do this and I, I found this great internet thing. I've got this guy from Botswana and he said uh, I'm going to get $5 million deposited and if I just forward this to seven people... And, this get-rich-quick scheme looks awesome, and you don't know what you didn't know, how clueless you were, until you maybe lost a couple thousand dollars. Or maybe you were that Marine, and the day you reported to boot camp, how could you have known what you didn't know until the drill instructor gets in your face and politely reminds you of your total ignorance? And by the way, this is also when Timmy realized this wasn't the bus to summer camp. <laughs> but you didn't know, because we don't know all that we don't know. And what we're learning this week is a very critical lesson. We've already backed up and we've said, your destination will be determined by your direction. The way you are going, the path you are on, 
According to Proverbs and Solomon, the path, the way your feet are going, is where you're going to end up. If you don't like the destination you see, it's up to you to be intentional and change it. You can't be shocked and you can't blame your mommy or your daddy or the culture for your steps. We have to take responsibility and say, I'm either going to follow Christ or I'm not. And I can't be upset if I'm going down a path that I chose and I saw the signs and I chose to do nothing about it, which was what we learned the second week. The prudent look ahead and see danger and say, no, 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 I'm going to take refuge. That's, that looks bad. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a mid-course correction. And that's a beautiful thing. And you're allowed to do that. You're even allowed to hit the reset button. But do we? And then we learn one of the most common mistakes we make is when we come to a fork in the road, we just trust our gut. And we buy into the lie of the culture. You know what? Just trust your heart. Just trust your heart. And then we see Jeremiah says, man, the heart is deceptive. It's deceitful above all things. I don't want to trust my heart. Man, I hope that's not the only judge of, of truth and right and wrong and, and how to distinguish between a thousand shades of gray. The heart is deceitful. Unless the Holy Spirit is the one that we're listening to. Which brings us to today. One of the most critical lessons to walking the path is figuring out what you don't know. And what do you do with that knowledge? There is something we can do to discover how to avoid potholes and landmines you never saw coming. Things you didn't even know were there because we don't even know what we don't know. Thankfully, Solomon comes along in Proverbs and shows us some amazing wisdom. Remember, the wisest man who's ever lived. Not only the wealthiest, but the wisest. And he gives us some practical help today. So open your Bibles to Proverbs 15. Or pull up your favorite Bible app, Proverbs 15. I'm going to read from the CSB translation today, the Christian Standard Bible. And while you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. If you're a first-time guest, a special welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. We pray God's Word will speak to you today as well. Proverbs chapter 15, we're going to look at verse 20, 21, and 22 to begin with. Follow along, and it says this. A wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Foolishness brings joy to the one without sense, but a person with understanding walks a straight path. Plans fail when there is no counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Wow. So how can you know what you don't know? It's right there. Did you catch it, that last part? You seek advice from advisors. But specifically, you seek advice from godly advisors the right advisors. Not just anyone will do. You think, oh, pastor, that's pretty straightforward, right? Don't we know that? Can we just go home? <laughs> Can we just get the barbecue going? Because we got, it's not just about knowing it. It's about doing it. And I think there's a mild difference between what we know is the right thing to do and actually doing it. For instance, there's an older married couple, and I love this couple. They're minding their own business. They're sitting on the front porch, and the wife looks over at the husband and says, Elmer, do you know what the two biggest problems are in this world today? And without missing a beat, Elmer says, sweetie, I don't know, and I don't care. And she lights up and says, yes, yes. How did you know that? He said, sweetie, I said, I don't know, and I don't care. She said, you nailed it again. Ignorance and apathy. Ignorance, I don't know, and apathy. I don't care. You know it both. That elder couple shows us some wisdom that we miss right here. That is the reason. Why don't we seek godly counsel? The answer is right there. Here's why we don't seek advice. Number one, we think we already know what we need to know. Well, that's ignorance. Nobody knows it all. And nobody likes to be around someone who thinks they're a know-it-all. Anybody know anybody like that? Yeah, they're called teenagers. What? Oh, did I say that? Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Step number two, why we don't seek advice, it's too much work to figure out how to get the right advice. That takes effort. Well, that's called apathy and laziness. The Bible actually calls it slothfulness. I love that because I picture the sloth just moving in slow motion, you know, slothfulness. There's one other reason why we don't seek godly counsel more often. If we're honest, it feels better to have people think we know what we're doing. It feels better to have people think we know exactly where we're going, right? Well, that's called pride. Again, men, I'm not lost. I know exactly where I'm going, honey. Really? Because that's a lake straight ahead, and the GPS is also wrong. And no, oh, it's the scenic route. We'll get there eventually. Church, humility would go a long way in our lives. Humility, being willing to 
to approach a mentor who's further down the path than we are. Sometimes what we do, though, is we plow straight ahead, and we think we know it all. We make plans without any counsel, and then we scratch our heads and we're shocked why they don't fail or why they don't succeed, and they fail, and they crash around our feet, and we're thinking, what just happened? Or at best, our plans are far less successful than they could have been if we honored Solomon's words. And the times we do get counsel, we get bad counsel because we go to the same little circle and we take it from the wrong people. Which brings us to the next question we need to answer today. Why don't we seek advice from wise counselors, from the godly people? And the answer to that, if we're honest, is it's easier to get advice from our common friends, from the group of people we like to associate with. Now hear me, don't take this out of context. There's nothing wrong with friends. Friends are great. There's nothing wrong with talking to friends and listening to what they have to say for advice. The problem is, because they are your common group of friends, they are walking the road alongside you. That means, generally, they are not any further down the road of life than you are. That's why they walk beside you. That's why they are common friends, and you share so much in common. Friends are great for friendship, but they aren't always great for giving advice. You know why? Because sometimes our friends don't want to hurt us. I get it. Sometimes they will actually tell you what you want to hear so that they don't hurt your feelings. I get it. We've been there. I've done that. You've done that. The second reason we don't seek wise counselors is because it's so much easier to follow the herd. This is the easy path, but it may not be the right path. Andy Stanley calls this the herd assumption. You know what that is? That's, that's the assumption that, well, the herd's going this way, so surely it can't be wrong. I mean, everybody's going this way. If everybody has three mortgages on their house and has maxed out five credit cards and is applying for a home equity line of credit, it can't be that bad, right? Everybody does that. Everybody has three mortgages these days. Not exactly. That may not be wisdom. Not everybody is right. And sometimes we need to look around and be willing to say, you know what, even though the whole wide road, this broad road is leading someplace, maybe I should check in with somebody who's actually been to the end of this road. Maybe there's somebody wiser that I could seek counsel from. That's what Solomon is saying. See, the problem is when we're walking along lockstep with everybody, you're all walking a similar destination, but nobody's arrived yet. They don't know what the end of the road is. That's why it's so important to seek godly counsel from people who are older than us from mentors, from people who are wiser, who have lived longer. See, we assume that everyone can't be wrong, but I read my Bible and it says broad is the way to destruction and narrow is the way that actually leads to life. Everybody can be wrong. Maybe that's not a safe road. And by the time it becomes obvious that this path is leading to a dangerous place, sometimes it's too late to do much about it. Perfect example, growing up in Florida, just on the other side of the state is Tampa Bay. And if you're old enough, you remember the Skyway Bridge. Man, what a gorgeous twin set of bridges. And because it was a bay, the fog would always roll in. And they were used to that. And people who lived there assumed the safe way to go is simply plow on ahead. Even when the fog comes, all you have to do is lock on to the taillights of the car in front of you at night and stay going fast enough that you don't lose sight of them. Except for one night, when Richard Hornbuckle was driving up this bridge, he saw the taillights, what he thought was cresting the bridge and just going down the other side. They weren't. A ship had come and had missed the opening and had nailed the pylons and the bridge had collapsed. A hundred feet were missing. And when he drove up and he kept seeing the headlights, the taillights disappear, they were going off the edge of the bridge. One right after the other, but he thankfully saw it just in time and he locked up his brakes 14 inches from going off the edge of the bridge. 14 inches. And then he had the presence of mind to get out, to run down the road, down the bridge, and stop everybody else, or it would have been one of the worst tragedies in American history. But he prevented so much death and carnage because he saw something. He was blindly going ahead. He saw the tail. Everybody's going. We're all doing 65 miles an hour in the fog going up this bridge. We've done it 100 times. Surely this is a safe road. But it wasn't. Here's another angle, just to give you the proper perspective of how safe and how danger were right there. That's so powerful. But here's what we do. I'm just going to follow along because the herd mentality says, there's no danger here. Surely we all can't be wrong when we're doing something like this. Here's the warning. 
If we're copying somebody, they need to be somebody you respect. We can't just be copying someone that maybe our siblings or someone who's a little older or maybe even our parents. See, a lot of times we'll do things and we'll say, oh, that's horrible, I'll never do that. We get older, we do the exact same thing and then we're shocked that we're turning out on the exact same path. Or maybe you're a parent now and you said, oh, my parents didn't know how to raise kids. I'm gonna do it so different. And then you look back and you're doing the exact same things that you complained about and you look at your kids and they're terrors too. And you're like, oh, how did this happen? You're doing the exact same thing. It's because we're on the same path. We haven't taken any steps. So how do we get good advice? How do we seek godly wisdom and change the path? The secret is found in Proverbs. Solomon says this in Proverbs 1.5. He says, let the wise listen and they'll add to their learning. Let the discerning get guidance. In other words, wise people listen to counsel and they get even wiser. Discerning people listen and gather guidance and they get further along the path. So get ready, get your pens ready. We're gonna dig into Proverbs and see Solomon's secrets here to getting good counsel. His first secret is right there in plain sight. Ask more than one person's advice. Ask more than one person's advice. Don't go to your buddy who you know is gonna tell you what you wanna hear. Hey, I'm thinking about leaving my wife and uh, you know, moving to Santa Barbara. So he goes, That's a great idea, abandon your family. No, 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 no. Ask more than one person. Don't go to the one who you know is gonna say exactly what you wanna hear. Look at Proverbs 11:14. Solomon says this, for lack of guidance, a nation falls, but many advisors make victory sure. Did you catch that word? What's the word before advisors? Many, not a few, not your buddy, not just one or two, many, many advisors is what gives you victory. When I was trying to discern God's will, and figure out if I should remain in North Carolina, if I should continue on and be the pastor at Potter's Hand. I did a lot of praying. But you know what else I did? I sought counsel. I talked to so many godly mentors, friends that I respected, people that I could consult with, that I could trust. I talked to family members that I knew loved me and only wanted their best for me and only wanted God's plan for my life. They didn't have a hidden agenda. And then I prayed and I talked to friends and family that I respected and looked up to. And then I consulted with my wife, the one who'd walked by my side for over two decades at that point. Someone that I knew had only my best interest at heart, a godly person that I would listen to. God used all of those people to help me confirm and discern his will. And it was the best decision I've ever made next to marrying her and finding Jesus. This right here, has it. this is it, many, Many advisors make victory sure. When the decision is important, hear what Solomon is saying to you. He's saying, ask more than one respected person for advice. Do you do that? Secret number two he shares is this. Don't let pride keep you from admitting what you don't know. Oh. Let's be honest. This is not easy, especially for us dudes. Pride is probably one of the number one enemies of walking a godly path. Did you know that? Pride is such a powerful enemy. Look at Proverbs 13, 10 with me. He says this, pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Did you catch that? There, there's a word in there that's very, very active. Wisdom is found in those who what advice? Take. They grab it. They don't just hear it, they grab it, they absorb it, they run with it. Think about that. Wise people are open to the fact that they don't know everything. They don't know everything there is to know and they're quick to go to people who know more and swallow their pride. It is humility there. Solomon then addresses it again in Proverbs 12. He says this, he says, the way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. Did you catch that? You see what he's saying? The way. That's another word for saying the path of a fool seems right to him. All right, so what does this look like in Realville? Yeah, you all know I love to break it down and get practical. What does this look like in you and I in our modern day world walking? Here it is. A friend comes up to us and says, listen, I've been watching you. I'm a little worried about the direction that I see you heading. I'm just, just a little concerned. I wanted to talk to you about it. A fool responds this way. What are you talking about? I'm fine. Nothing to see here, move on. But a wise person, when a friend comes up and says, hey man, listen, I'm a little worried about you. A wise person replies like this, really? I'm grateful that you, you care enough to tell me. Tell me what you're seeing. 
And then they listen. You see the difference? The fool denies it. Says, none of your business. But a wise person says, tell me what you're seeing. Thanks for caring. You're the first person to say anything. Here's what it looks like with a dad. A dad comes up to a son and says, son, I'm a little worried about some of the habits you're developing. The foolish son says, whatever, dad. <laughs> whatever. Leave me alone. You're so outdated. You know what a wise son says? A wise son says, dad, tell me what you're seeing. And then he listens. The mom goes to the daughter and says, honey, listen, I've been watching. I think the behavior that you're doing could someday get you in trouble. The foolish daughter says, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> They're so cool, they don't even have to finish the word. Just whatever. You're so old-fashioned, mom. But the wise daughter says, thank you, mom. Tell me what you're seeing. Let's talk about it. And then they listen. And they're not defensive about it. They listen. Why? Because these are people who only have their best interest at heart. Think how much pain would have been skipped if we actually listened to people who care, godly people who are down the path further. A supervisor, let's bring this into the work world. A supervisor comes up and says, listen, I know this is none of my business, but can I give you some advice? The foolish employee says, no. <laughs> and you're right, it is none of your business. You know what the wise employee says? Absolutely, you can give me some advice. Man, I'll take counsel and advice from anywhere I can get it. What do you got? And then he listens. He can always file it in chapter 13 over here in the little round bin called trash. But there just might be some nuggets of wisdom because if he's your supervisor, he's probably further down the road than you are. Which leads us to secret number three from Solomon. Take counsel from those who have been where you want to be. Those who are further down the road. Think about this. I think we, we look around and we wonder why our plans fail so often. Honestly, it's because the plans that we had weren't that great. <laughs> Sometimes they weren't the best plans. Other times we sabotage them because we go it alone. And we don't want to hear advice because I think if we're honest, should I say this? If we're honest, we're not going to want the counsel we get because we've already made up our mind to go this way. And we know if we counsel with somebody who's a little older, a little wiser, they say, that's a bad road. I, I've already made up my mind. I don't really want to hear your counsel. See, some of you are nodding because you know you've been there. Or you've got a family member who you've watched walk down a bad path. You think, how can they not see this? Well, they weren't open to listening to godly counsel. This is what we're called to do. We're supposed to actually listen to what it says. Proverbs 15, 22, plans fail for lack of counsel. But with many advisors, your plans succeed. Your life and my life are on paths. The path will either lead us toward where you really want to go or it's going to lead you away from where you want to go. So I got to ask, how's your path? Spiritually, relationally, professionally, financially. Every one of us are on a path. Do you like where it's going? If not, God offers midlife course corrections and they're free. But it takes one thing intentionality. We have to be willing to make our life come in line with God's word. And that is not popular. That is not what you're going to hear in most modern pulpits. God's word is the source of wisdom. The wise man and the wise woman seek counsel from God's word. They seek counsel from wise people and they listen to it and they heed it and they walk a path that leads where they actually want to go. Not the path they're on because it's, oh, I'm a victim. I've done. No, uh -uh. no, you're free. God has broken those chains. You have the intentionality. You can do what God is calling you to do. The question is, are you willing to step off that path? What would, how, how different would your life be like if you had changed just a few steps? Let me ask you this. Imagine for a minute what your life would be like if you had developed a habit early on, instead of being impulsive, or instead of being on the other extreme, indecisive, and seeking wisdom from a mentor. Seeking wisdom from somebody who's godly. Seeking someone who maybe have silver hair. Somebody who may have no hair. <laughs> somebody who's been down the road farther than you. How much different would your life be if you approached them in humility and asked for godly counsel? Parents, what could we learn and what heartaches could we save ourselves and save our children if we counseled with other seasoned parents who are a little further down the path than we were? Think of the pain we could save ourselves. See, Proverbs says the prudent look ahead. They see the danger and they make plans to avoid it. 
It's not rocket science. It's actually pretty simple. Students, imagine how much better, how much better you're prepared you would be to enter the workforce if you, from time to time, linked up with a mentor or someone older, someone who you admire, and asked them for advice. How do I study God's word and, and pour wisdom into my path? How do I approach homework? What classes should I take? Should I go to trade school? What university do you recommend? Imagine how much more fluff we could cut out if we did that. Employees, imagine the steps we could save if we sought advice from our supervisor, from godly people who were abed, who were further down in the field, further down the path, and we asked for guidance. It wouldn't be that hard. None of Solomon's steps are hard. They just take that one word I said, intentionality. And Solomon is coming through this, and he's, he's broken it down. He said, these are the three steps to success in living a godly life. So my question is this, what will you do with this advice today? Because that will reveal how wise we are. My counsel is this. Here's your challenge. Number one, come back next week because Solomon's not done. There is more wisdom. We've learned every week. We've been growing in wisdom each time we come together. But Solomon has a few more lessons to teach us, and they are powerful. Come back next week. Number two, finish the book of Proverbs. If you've been reading along since we started this path three or four weeks ago, then you know you're probably on chapter 28 now. And you know because you're a good person, you've been doing these challenges, you know there's 31 chapters, and you're almost done. But if you haven't joined this challenge, you haven't taken this path, this step, do it. Over the next two weeks, you can finish it. Reading a chapter a day keeps the stupid away. Absolutely. It keeps the silliness away. It keeps the bad decisions away. A chapter a day. It's like the doctor, an apple a day. This is what Proverbs does. Finish it within the next two weeks, and we'll all be on the same page. Number three, ask God to show you the counselors he has for you. Any of you lack wisdom? Let him ask God. God, who do you have? Who are these counselors? Is it a small group teacher? Is, do I need to seek somebody out for lunch and say, hey, will you come? Will you meet me? Will you, will you mentor me? This is godly wisdom from Solomon, which leads to number four. Then your challenge is to seek advice this week from that someone who's where you want to be. Mm, now it's getting a little more real. Now I actually got to take a step and do something here. Seek advice this week from someone who's where you want to be, or at least further along the path. And then ultimately, as good as human advice can be, Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. And here's where the plane lands. This is so interesting to me because the whole time Jesus was on earth, the phrase he used more than any other were these two words. Follow me. Follow me. That's a directional statement. Think about that. Don't miss this. He's saying, walk with me. Walk behind me. Walk on the path I'm walking. Come to me, all you who are weary, all you who are heavy laden, all you who are burdened, and I will will give you rest. Come to me, follow me, for the yoke that I'm going to place on you on this road that we will walk together is light. My burden is easy. The one I give you will seem light to you, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart. And as you follow me, you will find rest for your souls. Wow. Anybody want that? That sounds like a path worth let me pray for us. Bow with me. God, I thank you for the wisdom of the ages contained in your holy book. I thank you for what Solomon has done, showing us the secrets, the wisest one who's ever lived that you gifted with astounding wisdom. And yet the secrets are right there for us to follow. Thank you for that, Lord. Lord, would you help us to move from intentionality and thinking and dreaming to actually taking steps and following you to getting off a path that we know is bad, a path that may be leading to sin or a path that's just holding us back. Lord, give us that holy unction to say, enough, no more this day. And Lord, help us to get on your path. Show us what it is. Lord, light it up in the spiritual realm so we cannot miss it. And Lord, we go a step further. We ask that you would surround us with godly people. Give us wisdom. Give us godly counselors. Give us mentors. Show us who it is that you want us to seek advice from as we grow deeper in the faith, as we study your word. Lord Jesus, we want to be more like you. Show us the path to walk. May we be faithful to follow you now. In Jesus' name, amen.